If you're developing an electronic product, you've probably been programming your prototype manually using a development board or an external programmer. But what about when you're ready to build 100 units or 1,000 units or tens of thousands of units? How do you reliably get your firmware into every microcontroller on every board without holding up production or blowing your budget? It's one of the most common questions I get, and today I'm going to walk you through every stage from prototyping to production and explain methods used to program microcontrollers at scale. In the early stages, you're probably using a development board, something like an Arduino, an STM32 Nucleo board, or an ESP32 dev kit. These boards are built for convenience. They usually have a USB interface and come preloaded already with a bootloader so that you can just connect them to your computer and flash new firmware without any special tools. And a bootloader is just a small piece of code that runs immediately when the microcontroller powers on. And its job is to check whether it should enter programming mode, so waiting for new firmware, or if it should jump straight into running the application code that's already uploaded. Many microcontrollers include a factory bootloader that listens on the USB port, on UART, and this lets you program the chip without a debugger, just a serial connection or a USB cable. It's a convenient option, especially in prototypes or low volume production runs. Now, if you're building a custom board with a bare microcontroller, you may or may not want to rely on the built-in bootloader. If the microcontroller supports it, then programming via a direct USB connection is usually, I find, the simplest option. For example, some STM32 models support the official USB DFU or Device Firmware Update Protocol, whereas some ESP32 models include an expressive bootloader that isn't specifically compliant with the USB DFU protocol, but still allows USB flashing. But you might instead use an external USB programmer like an ST-Link or a J-Link, which connects using a debug interface like SWD or JTAG, and it depends on the specific microcontroller what type of debug interface it supports. This method is more robust for development, especially when debugging firmware or working with chips that don't have a convenient bootloader. However, these external programmers can be quite expensive and commonly cost a few hundred dollars, although there are cheaper knockoffs that are usually available and work reliably. Either way, just make sure your board gives you access to the programming interface. That could be a standard header or even just test pads, but it needs to be there from the very first revision. Once you're building more than just a handful of prototype units, maybe for beta testing or crowdfunding backers or pilot production, you likely are gonna need a better process than flashing each board manually by hand. One common approach here is to build a pogo pin jig. It's not something you hear every day, but these are the simplest text fixtures where pogo pins make contact with programming pads on the PCB. And pogo pins are just spring-loaded pins that can the spring helps it make some physical contact with the pad. You just drop in the board, close the lid, and the script flashes the firmware for you. This saves time plugging and unplugging each board and avoids soldering headers on every board just for programming. Another option, only if your firmware is stable though, is to pre-program the microcontroller chips before you assemble them on the boards. This can be done with a chip socket programmer or using small scale programming services. Just keep in mind that if your firmware changes after the chips are programmed, well then you're stuck either reprogramming them or scrapping them. So this approach really only makes sense when you're confident in your firmware version. Also, always remember to include a readable firmware version number in your software, may be accessible via serial or the USB port. It's a small thing though that can really save you massive headaches when you're trying to figure out which units have which firmware uploaded. At higher production volumes, then you have two main paths. You can use pre-programmed chips or you can use in-circuit programming during production. Let's start with using pre-programmed chips, which is generally the easiest option. In this case, you send your final firmware binary to a third-party programming service. And this could be a large distributor like DigiKey or Arrow, or sometimes even the microcontroller manufacturer may offer this service. 
So they load your code onto each microcontroller before it's shipped to your contract manufacturer. Often, they'll also apply labels, laser markings, or track firmware versions for you. And this method is fast, it's scalable, and it keeps your assembly line simple. Your factory doesn't have to do any flashing. It just places the chip and goes. But there are trade-offs. Of course, there's always trade-offs. First, your firmware must be finalized, as I've already mentioned. That doesn't just mean feature complete. It means tested, versioned, and ideally with some security protections incorporated. You also need to coordinate carefully with both your contract manufacturer and the programming service. If your firmware is still evolving, or if you want to combine flashing with functional testing, then you're going to want to go with in-circuit programming on the production line. In this setup, the factory has a test jig with pogo pins, and after the PCB is assembled, each unit is placed into this fixture, and it gets powered up and flashed automatically. This process is slower than pre-programming the chips ahead of time, but it gives you flexibility of being able to flash the latest firmware version and running board-level tests. To make this work, your board design needs to have dedicated test points or pads that line up with the pogo pins on the test jig. It's also a good practice to add ESD protection and filtering on these pins since they'll be exposed during manufacturing. Once your product ships, well, now you have to think about how to update the firmware, whether that is to fix bugs, add new features, or patch security holes. And there are a few ways to handle this. If your product has a USB port, you can implement firmware updates using the DFU mode or a custom bootloader. Or if your product has Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, or cellular, well, then you can implement over-the-air OTA updates. And OTA updates are not a free feature, and it's really a full subsystem. This kind of bootloader is a lot more complex and made to be more robust than ones used for factory programming. It needs to sit between the hardware and your main application with the ability to manage firmware partitions, validate digital signatures, and recover from failed updates. For many simple products, over-the-air updates are going to be overkill, but if your product is a connected product in the field for the long term, it can be really valuable to be able to do over-the-air updates. And even if you never plan to update the firmware, you still need to think about how to recover a non-functional locked up device or apply a critical patch. So keep a backup way to reflash the firmware if necessary, even if it's just exposed test pads inside the enclosure. You can watch the next video that I recommend for you, which is yeah, right there.